So today it's my pleasure to introduce Ilana Hefes, who is here from the Hormel Institute. She is an assistant professor at Hormel, and she's been there about a year and a half. And she's interested in ovarian cancer, and particularly in stem cell um, activity in ovarian cancer, as well as um, the process of um, necroptosis. So she completed her early training, all of her early training is in Israel and in Haifa at Technion, where she got her Bachelor of Science degree, her master's degree, and her PhD. She then uh, traveled to Yale and was a postdoc there, where she entered the field of ovarian cancer research, and then went briefly to Michigan as a postdoc there, and continued her work in ovarian cancer. And she has been awarded numerous uh, fellowships and awards um, for her work and um, ended up at the Hormel Institute about a year and a half ago, as I said, um, where she enjoys being the Hormel organizer person. And so she does the seminar series and a lot of the events, and that's how we met as she asked me to come over to Hor Hormel, and I had a fun day there. So thank you for coming, um, and she's going to talk today about her work in ovarian cancer stem cell biology. We have to clip this on. Yeah, we will play. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for this nice introduction. Okay, I just wanted to add for the Hormel Institute, located two hours from here in Minnesota, because not many people know this, okay? Okay, so today we will be talking about novel inhibitors for aldehyde dehydrogenase, and I will be talking exactly and mention what are aldehyde dehydrogenase. We actually showed what these novel inhibitors trigger cell program necrosis or necroptosis, which, which is in part associated with this increase in uncoupling proteins. And we also showed that it's very effective in vivo and in vitro alone and in combination with conventional chemotherapy. So a little bit very short introduction about ovarian cancer. As you know, ovarian cancer is one of the deadliest cancer along with lung and pancreatic cancer. A therapy is usually comprised from debulking surgery and then followed by cisplatin and paclitaxel. Very important to mention, this is one of the deadliest disorders because it's usually diagnosed very late. But I'm not going to talk about these early markers. We have Amy Skubitz, who I'm sure did a wonderful job about this. But this is a big problem because when it's diagnosed, the patient already in stage three on four, it's impossible to take entire tumor. So first, they perform the bulking, which is just taking as much of tumor as possible, and then it's followed by chemotherapy. One of the really great uh, development in treatment of ovarian cancer is PARP inhibitors, especially for BRCA-positive patients. If you have any question, I'm happy to talk later on about PARP inhibitors, but this is not my topic of interest. And what is really important, initially ovarian cancer is really responsive to this regimen, but disease is coming back very fast in weeks and sometimes months. And when disease is coming back, it's a recurrent ovarian cancer, and cells are resistant. So depend how fast the disorder came back, it's called sensitive or resistant. If it's longer than six months, it's called uh, sensitive. And when it comes back, there is another round of regular cisplatin and paclitaxel. There are very limited number of chemotherapies for second round. But uh, a big hope currently of ovarian cancer with PARP inhibitors, and there is unmet need for novel therapies. So we think what this really high rate of recurrency is associated with cancer stem cells. And I will be talking, there are a number of different cancer stem cell markers. I will be talking mostly about aldehyde dehydrogenase and CD133. So aldehyde dehydrogenase, or shortly LDH, is a big group of enzymes comprised of 19 different enzymes. Then can be expressed on cytosol or mitochondria. And their major 
function is to take aldehydes and convert them to corresponding carboxylic acids. So by this, they do detoxification. So they take toxic compounds and they convert them to corresponding carboxylic acid. A big problem that they can, can convert both endogenous and exogenous aldehydes in many chemotherapies they are in form of aldehydes. So these LDH enzymes can basically convert chemotherapy to not efficient one just because they decrease effective concentration of chemotherapy. There are other LDH functions which make uh, cells which express high percentage of LDH to resistant. So there was a first paper published in 2008 by Bukanovich lab. There he showed what high percentage of LDH, especially double positive with CD133 cell surface markers, is associated with poor prognosis and chemo resistance. What is really important to know, as little as few double positive cells can initiate tumors in mice. So these are all characteristics of cancer themselves. Chemo resistance, tumor initiation capacity, and ability to divide asymmetrically and symmetrically, just like every single stem cell, not necessarily cancer. And uh, as you can see here, so double positive cells is labeled with yellow because we mark CD133 with red, just with immunofluorescence, and LDH activity with green. So double positive cells will be yellow. So the cell can divide, and this is asymmetric cell division, and it can lose CD133, and then it's just green, or it can lose LDH, and then it's become only red. In turn, this single positive cell can differentiate asymmetrically and give rise to double negative cells. These double negative cells, they are non-cancer stem cells, and they comprise bulk of the tumor. So to show what LDH and CD133 positive, they indeed cancer stem cells and have this capacity to differentiate symmetrically and asymmetrically, what we use is microfluidic chip. So the specifics of microfluidic chips, you have multiple valves hundreds, okay? And each cell is getting only one cell, okay? So you can use a flow antibodies, just like I said, LDH is labeled with green and CD133 is labeled with red. You can fax sort cells and basically load single positive cells. You can confirm how well the cells got, uh, were sorted this is just running immediately one day after plating the immunofluorescence and confirm the selectivity of your sorting. Afterwards, cells divide, and on a daily basis, you can uh, run immunofluorescence again and just image what cells you get and then calculate how many green, yellow, red, or no color cells and then calculate their symmetric or asymmetric cell division. So as you can see here, green cell can be divided to two green cells or it uh, can uh, lose color and so on. So based on this information, we basically calculate a symmetric and asymmetric cell division and it's presented here. So double positive cells showed their capacity to divide symmetrically and asymmetrically in, on a single cell base, and this is actually proof of their cancer stem cell properties. So next, our hypothesis was if LDH positive cells were these resistant cells which have capacity to initiate and propagate tumors, if we target specifically LDH positive cells, we maybe can uh, kill them. So first to understand which LDH are important in ovarian cancer cells, 
We ran qPCR for uh, many different LDH uh, enzymes. And as I mentioned, it's a big family of enzyme comprised of 19 different ones. But the most interesting one is family which is called LDH1A. This family uh, comprised from 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3. Their most important substrate is retinol. And these enzymes convert retinol to retinoic acid. And as we know, retinoic acid is a transcription factor. It can bind to promoters and can drive multiply, multiply processes, including embryogenesis, metastasis, and so on. So indirectly, this family LDH1A, we actually produce retinoic acid, which binds to promoters of 100 genes and drive many important signaling pathway. So it's, we screened 20 different ovarian cancer cell lines and the different primary samples. And what we found using qPCR, what majority of cells express at least several LDH. And this is what is the most important. Because literature is full with a lot of uh, are, uh, papers which associate chemo resistance with only 1A1, okay? But we know what many cells express at least two different LDH. Some of them have high expression of 1A1. Some of them have high expression of 1A3. And the less uh, ovarian cancer cells express 1A2. So what is important from here, an important conclusion, this is not enough to target only 1A1. We have to target at least several LDH. And this is just of confirmation using in silico data from uh, ovarian cancer cell line showing exactly the same results what we got from QPCR. Ovarian cancer cell lines express at least two or more LDH1 in enzymes. So, to mimic this data, what we did, we down-regulated using sRNA 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3 in a three different ovarian cancer cell lines. And down-regulation of this LDH was associated with decrease in proliferation. Again, just the same conclusion. It's not enough to down-regulate only one LDH to decrease proliferation of ovarian cancer cells. And what is was really interesting when we down-regulated 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3, we also decreased percentage of CD1 30 positive cells. So what you can see here is a flow chart, and an X axis, this is CD1 33. So this is sorted cells. They have 42% of CD1 30 positive cells. But then we down-regulate LDH. We also decrease CD1 30 cell number. So using all these data, we decided what we have to develop a novel inhibitor of LDH activity, which will inhibit equally well 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3, because uh, all three of them were expressed in ovarian cancer cell lines. So this compound was a base to chemical synthesis, and we uh, worked in collaboration with a chemist at University of Michigan who used this compound as a base and synthesized hundreds of compounds. We used these compounds and we screened them in LDH activity assay because we wanted A, active compounds which effectively target LDH activity, but based on our previous results, we also wanted compounds which decrease number of CD130 positive cells. And we have in our collection many compounds, but I will be mostly talking about compounds which are called 673A. So this compound, as you can see, this is a flow chart now as well. But right now on, on X, X, we have LDH activity measured by Aldefluor fax 
essay. And as you can see, this is sorted cells. They have 77% of LDH activity. When we inhibit LDH activity with 673, already after one hour, we have a decrease to 2% and so on. And DB, as I mentioned, they are base compound, which is effective in reduction of LDH activities as well, but not as good. You can see 48% and 2% in 673. So we used a variety of enzymology assay, and we confirmed that this compound targets specifically LDH1A family. So you can see here, I see 50 for LDH 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3. This is for 673. And you can see what this compound inhibits equally well all three enzymes from this family and is not active against other LDH. As I mentioned, there are 19 different LDH. Okay, so we used, uh, we used all possible ovarian cancer cell lines, primary samples, and so on, and we confirm effectiveness of our compound 673. As you can see here, there is LDH activity in control group, and it's completely diminished by 673A. The sulfuram, it's a different LDH inhibitor, which mostly inhibits LDH. Two, and it's related mostly LDH2 to some uh, disorder associated with a pro not appropriate alcoholism, uptake, alcohol uptake, and so on. But it's not as effective as our new compound 673A. So to confirm specificity of 673A, we used the cell line, which has a very separate population of LDH positive cells and CD1 or 3 positive cells. As you can see, when we treat this DB, which is our control, we diminish LDH activity, but CD1 or 3 cells are not affected. As opposed to this, our favorite inhibitor 673 both diminish LDH activity and number of CD1 or 3 positive cells. So to confirm 673A specificity, what we did, we fact sorted LDH positive, here they are uh, blue, and LDH negative cells. So cisplatin, as I mentioned, this is a conventional chemotherapeutic drug in ovarian cancer. As you can see, LDH positive cells, uh, YX here is percentage of viable cells. So following um, treatment, this uh, cisplatin, LDH positive cells, they are not sensitive. You can see what more than 85% are still viable, as opposed to LDH negative cells, which are really dying from cisplatin. The 673A is the opposite uh, picture. We have LDH negative cells, which are not dying, and we have 673 LDH positive cells, which are dying, which exactly confirms specificity of 673 inhibitor to LDH positive cells. So we tried uh, to run MTT assay for different ovarian cancer cell lines. As I mentioned, our inhibitor targets specifically cancers themselves, so we don't expect very high activity in cancer cell lines because they comprise from majority non-cancer stem cells and minority of uh, cancer stem cells. To show again specificity, we fact sorted CD130 positive cells and CD130 negative cells. We treated them with different uh, concentration of compound 673A and we followed this for 72 days, uh, hours, sorry, this uh, real-time imaging. And as you can see, CD133 positive cells, again, confirming our previous results are way more sensitive to LDH inhibitors than CD133 negative cells. So it was also confirmed using fax analysis. Again, this is X axis here is CD133 positive cells. As we treat this increasing concentration with 673, we decrease number of CD133 positive cells. And this is true for a cell line, and this is also true from, for fax sorted cells. Alana, would you see the same thing with retinoic acid receptor? 
uh, if we saw something uh, very similar, yes, but it was so. Oh, should I repeat this question? Yeah, I just asked if I asked if for the people not on site, if retinoic acid receptor modulation would also be a strategy with these drugs, perhaps. Uh, I think very partially, yes, because it's part of this is potential downstream retinoic acid, but uh, you will see in further results there are also other additional effects, yes. So it's, uh, everything is very complex and potentially partially it will mimic some results, but not fully. So as we showed, we effectively target cancer stem cells. So our next question was actually, how do they die? And we actually proved they are dying by a variety of different assays, just because this is a lot of results, I just don't show this. And as you know, right now we know about a lot of different cell death pathways, but still, apoptosis is a major one. So as you know, apoptosis is very distinctive. Uh, morphologically, you have a cell shrinkage, creation of apoptotic bodies, and so on, then phagocytosis. So an alternative cell death pathway is necrosis, and morphologically, it's really very distinct. You have swelling of cells and organelles. You have increase in calcium. You have decrease in ATP. You have rupture of cellular membrane and then release of cellular contact. So if you want to distinguish between apoptosis and necroptosis, there are different signaling pathway, but morphologically, it's the, the best way to distinguish. And just to remind you about uh, necroptosis or self-programmed necrosis, it was um, established approximately seven, eight years ago when people used uh, uh, caspase inhibitors, okay? So it would block apoptosis, and they treated cells with TNF-alpha. So what they noticed, rather than just rescuing cells from apoptosis, cells were dying, but by a different cell death pathway. So if you block uh, apoptosis and trigger cell death with, necro with TNF-alpha, cell will die by cell programmed necrosis. And it's really, really amazing because TNF-alpha can do three things. It can go to pro-survival through NF-kappa B, yes, and it can trigger apoptosis if caspases are available, and it can trigger necroptosis if caspases are inhibited. Okay, so whatever direction you go, you die, unless you go through uh, NF-kappa B and then you survive, which is not good for cancer. We want to kill cancer cells. What well, is really important for me to mention, this is very artificial model of cell program necrosis because you block uh, caspases and then you treat the TNF-alpha. And if you want to compare two real things what happen in cancer and you know, different pathologies, not necessarily your caspases will be uh, inhibited, but still you have necroptosis. What is really important to mention, this is way more complex than when you have inhibition of caspases, you have necroptosis, okay? And uh, actually, a machinery is very similar. So there is a complex in apoptosis when you have TRAD, FAD, RIP, RIP kinase 3, and then caspases are available, there is a trigger of apoptosis. Then caspases are not available, RIP kinase 1 and RIP kinase 3, they phosphorylate each other, there is a, a downstream event where they uh, phosphorylate a kinase called MLKL, MLKL is going to a membrane, physically makes holes in membrane, and this is the most we know about necroptosis. Just MLKL translocate to a membrane, physically makes holes there, and there is execution of necroptosis. Okay, so to ask what kind of cell death we actually trigger with our compounds, we ran 
apoptosis annexin PI assay. Just to remind you briefly, so you will have annexin positivity when cells are apoptotic. Cells, early apoptotic cells will be positive only for annexin. Late apoptotic cells will be positive both for annexin and PI. And necrotic cells will be positive only for PI. So as you can see here, 673, if we ran this with uh, maybe 20 different ovarian cell lines by now, causes uh, only PI positive cells without any positivity with an X and positive cells. And Shikonin, this is a Chinese hair medicine which has been shown to cause both necroptosis and apoptosis depends on a model and concentration. And in our hands with ovarian cancer cell lines, it mostly causes apoptosis. This is just our positive control. So to confirm, we do not trigger apoptosis. We use a different, an additional approach. We use caspase inhibitor, which is uh, showing here as caspase inhibitor. This is general caspase inhibitor. And we used also caspase 3 inhibitor. So if, cell, if compounds call apoptotic cell death and you block uh, caspases, you would rescue cell death. In our case, we didn't rescue cell death. The opposite, with high concentration, we even increased the cell death. So we can conclude for here this is caspase independent non apoptotic cell death. So as I mentioned, morphologically necroptosis and apoptosis are very distinct. So we perform transmission electronic microscopy. And as you can see here, this is a cell, a control cell, and this is following treatment with 673. We, we can really appreciate increase in cell volume. You can see here rupture of cellular membrane and release of cellular content. You can also see these are mitochondria in normal cells, and these are mitochondria in 673 treated cells. And just to appreciate more, I have here enlargement of high magnification picture. You can see what following 673, we have these huge mitochondria, and we also have appearance of these vacuoles, which are also signs of necrotic cell death. So based on transmission electronic morpho uh, tra uh, uh, microscopy, we have a cell death with necrotic morphology. As I mentioned earlier, ne uh, necroptosis is dependent on calcium. So A, we quantify calcium level using flow assay, and we indeed confirm increase in calcium. As a next step, we use compounds which are called BAPTA, which just physically bind the calcium. And we showed that when we pre-treated this BAPTA, we completely rescued cell death. It means that our cell death is calcium dependent. And this is was true for total cell number and also for CD133 cell number, as you can appreciate from this fax analysis. So to mimic this, we used SI RNA against 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3. And then we just, uh, again, ran an XNPI to confirm what kind of cell we have. As you can see, uh, then we downregulate 1A2 and 1A3. We have only necrotic cells. When we downregulate 1A1, we have main mixture population of both APRO in apoptotic and necroptotic cell death. And if we use compound which only inhibit 1A1, it's actually completely resemble this FAX result. This is like mixed population of necroptosis and apoptosis. So just to summarize a little bit, we were able to develop and characterize novel LDH inhibitor, which are uh, causing cell death which is independent of caspases. It doesn't show apoptosis. Based on transmission electronic microscopy, it's showing necrotic morphology, and it's calcium dependent. As I previously showed in these uh, schematics, two major players in necroptosis, then RIP kinase 1 and RIP kinase 3. 
So to show what cells are dying by necroptosis, we use two different approaches. We downregulated drip kinase one using sRNA, and we also used a compound which called necrostatin one, which is uh, this compound inhibiting kinase activity of rib kinase one. Using both of these uh, approaches, we couldn't detect uh, dependency of rib kinase one because cell death was not rescued. Back several years ago, it was a very new finding what actually necroptotic cell death can be independent of rib kinase one. Today, based on last year paper, we know what necroptosis only requires rib kinase 3. In some models, this is rib kinase 1 dependent, but rib kinase 1 activity is very modular, depend on cell model and the expression of other genes. Actually, rib kinase 1 uh, can do both necroptosis, apoptosis, and also diminish both of them. So it's mean kind of this, um, it's a complex. So dependence of availability of other genes, rib kinase 1, can trigger different signal pathways. And it's really important right now because very often necrostatin 1 is um, used to show a dependency on rib kinase 1, which means necroptosis. This will be not enough because rib kinase 1 can be involved in many functions, including to block necroptosis or promote apoptosis. It's all model dependent. So similarly, rib kinase 3, as I mentioned, it's really important for propagating necroptotic signal. So we use two different approaches. Again, we use this sRNA to down-regulate rib kinase 3. We also use compound which called necrosulfamide, which is inhibitor of rib kinase 3 downstream target MLKL, what I previously explained about. What was really surprising, these cells, they are not sensitive to cisplatin. They, sur uh, they survive cisplatin very nicely because they are CD133 positive cells. But when you downregulate rib kinase 3, you diminish cell proliferation by at least 70%. Yes. So our cells are really sensitive to downregulation or inhibition of rib kinase 3. And today we know when you uh, downregulate or inhibit rib kinase 3, you can switch between uh, necroptosis to apoptosis. So it's again, it's a very complex uh, uh, signaling cascade which depends, can promote many different things. If we use a uh, lower concentra uh, higher concentration of 6 and 3, we can uh, detect some risk of, of uh, cell death, uh, potentially showing some dependency on rib kinase 3. But because our cells are so sensitive to down regulation of rib kinase 3, it's uh, really difficult to conclude something. So we use additional two different approaches. So as I mentioned, there is rib kinase 1 and rib kinase 3. There is also a parallel signaling pathway which can be part of classical necroptosis and can be separate. And there are two different proteins which are important in this signaling pathway. They are PGM5 and DRP1. DRP1, they are mitochondria fusion protein, okay? So when mitochondria are dividing, there is really important role of DRP1. And PGM5 dephosphorylates DRP1 and makes it actually active. It's the opposite. It dephosphorylates and makes it active. When DRP1 is active, it translocates from cytoplasm to mitochondria, okay? And uh, for MLKL, true, very similar thing when MLKL is active, it uh, translocates from cytoplasm to membrane. And as I mentioned earlier, it makes these holes in the membrane and triggering necroptosis. So what we did here actually, we co-immunoprecipitated uh, cells, uh, control cells, and treated with 673. 
separately with FAD, DRP1, and rip 3 and then we detected this PGM5. So we were able to see increased complex formation with PGM5 every single fraction when we treated the 673. Similarly, we were able to detect dephosphorylation of DRP1. As you can uh, see here, when it was dephosphorylated and translocated from cytoplasm, disappeared from cytoplasm and start appearing in mitochondria. For MLKL, it's true as well. It started translocating from cytoplasm to membrane, most likely making holes in membrane. So we can tell what most likely this is ribkinase uh, 3 dependent and PGM5 and DRP1 has an important role in this kind of necroptosis. But further work is needed actually to purify entire complex and see what happens during and what are the time points. This is actually one of the aims of my early career grant that I received to purify entire necroptosome. This is 20 megadalton complex. Yes, and then to see what's going on there in Pons translational modica modification, how this complex is bound and so on. So as I mentioned, remember one, one of the most important substrate of LDH is retinoic acid. So we screened many, many, many targets of retinoic acids. Uh, and one of the interesting ones was uncoupling protein. So these proteins you may be heard about in regard to metabolism, diabetes, or any kind of metabolism protein, uh, problems. They are family of uncoupling protein. Just to remind you, oxidative phosphorylation is not fully coupled with this production of ATP. There is leak of protons, so it's a, there is a waste of energy. And actually, uncoupling protein, this is what they do. They basically waste energy, okay? There is reduction in oxidative phosphorylation. And they are also, based on li literature, down, downstream targets of retinoic acid. So we profiled the USP, USCP expression following treatment with 673A. As you can appreciate here, there is a big increase in UCP 1 and 3 level. It's especially true for, I don't know if you can see here, for CD133 positive cell. As I mentioned earlier, CD133 positive cells are more sensitive to our inhibitors than non a CD133 positive. And I think one, one of the reasons is first the basal level of ECP initially is higher in CD130 positive cells. So when you treat the 673, they reach this threshold very, very fast and they die. And you need very certain level of uncoupling proteins, very specific threshold. If this is above threshold, cell die if it's a below threshold cell die as well. So very, very specific range of uncoupling proteins for cells to survive, okay? And this is true for many metabolism-related cells. Too high level, this is not good, and too low level is not good as well. Okay, and we were able to um, confirm these results by down-regulating uh, using sRNA. We were able to see upregulation in both UCP1 and UCP3. So here is results associate increase in UCPs with LDH1A1, 1A2, and 1A3 downregulation. We tried to mimic these results, so we overexpressed UCPs, and we detected decrease in cellular proliferation, and this decrease in cellular proliferation was associated with positivity in only necrotic cells. There are no appearance of apoptotic cells. So as I mentioned, oxidative phosphorylation and uncoupling proteins they are related. So we use seahorse real-time analysis to detect uh, oxidative phosphorylation. We detected basal and respiratory capacity and ATP production. 
So you can see here decrease fallen LDH inhibition in basal respiratory capacity and also in ATP production. So to summarize this in vitro part, we develop characterize these inhibitors. They kill specifically cancers themselves. This is caspase independent, non-apoptotic, hypokinase one independent, calcium and hypokinase three dependent, and associated with necrotic morphology based on transmission electronic microscopy. Are there any questions so far? No. Okay. So we move to Actually, we will skip radiosynthesis digitization because it's less relevant to ovarian cancer. But what is really important is this synergy, this conventional chemotherapy, because we don't only want to kill cancers themselves. We want to kill entire population of tumor cells. So what we did here, we actually, you can see here, we treated either with cisplatin or cisplatin with 673 until here, and then we refreshed to medium without any drugs, okay? Just mimicking patient uh, situation because they receive drugs and then they don't get any chemotherapy anymore. As so you can appreciate here, cells that were treated with cisplatin, they were able to regrow, recapitulate, Cells were uh, treated with combinational treatment, they actually didn't recapitulate. So we re repeated this experiment, but what we did, we treated our cells in vitro, and then we fax sorted only viable cells. So you fax sort viable cells based on negativity of annexin and PI, yes, and we injected them into mouse. And this tumor initiation capacity is a very standard procedure for proving cancer stem cell stemness. So from these viable cells, we injected very small numbers, 200, 1,000, 5,000, and we followed these mice to see if they will die or survive. As you can see from a if, if we injected 200 cells in control cells, in all four mice, we're able to establish tumors. In cisplatin, three out of eight tumors were established. In 673, 25% tumors were established. But when we treated this cisplatin in 673, zero tumors were established. So it's showing actually treated in, cells treated in vitro with combinational treatment then FAC sorted for viable cells, 200 viable cells, actually the cells were not uh, able to establish tumors in vivo. This is called tumor initiation capacity. So to make it more functional, because we work with these ovarian cancer cell lines, we moved to ovarian cancer primary samples. So we created here 3D spheroids and we treated with 673. As you can appreciate, there is was because spheroids are enriched, these cancers themselves, they actually, primary spheroids were very sensitive to 673. And then we, based on our findings, we ran approximately 20 different in vivo experiments because it's a new compound and it was really important to show effectiveness in different models of ovarian cancer. So uh, as you can see here, we established first tumors approximately with 75K of cells. And three days after, we treated for three weeks with 673A, and then we harvested tumors. As you can see here, following treatment with 673, there was significant reduction in tumor growth. You can see it's also, I don't know if you are able to see, there is some necrotic morphology following treatment with 673 and decrease in uh, cellular proliferation as showed by KI67. So then we ran a few other in vivo experiments where we combined 673 with cisplatin, and as you can appreciate, in combination, it provides best results in terms of decrease of tumor growth. So here we injected very small amount of cells. We treated only for three weeks, and then we followed these mice for six months. 
as you can see here, is percentage of mice tumor-free at six months. And the treatment was very short just to mimic a real situation. So as you can see, when we combine cisplatin 673, almost 60% mice was tumor-free. And this um, following treatment with 673, also in vivo, we can appreciate this increase in UCP1 and UCP3. Here, this panel, it's a different in vivo in, uh, experiment. What we did, we fax sorted only 5,000 cells. We injected them into mice, and we treated for three weeks. When we followed mice for six months. As you can see here, uh, mice what were treated for three weeks with platin, they died. And mice what were treated with this platin and 673, more than 50% survived. Okay, and this is just more of in vivo data. This is a genetic engineered model of ovarian cancer. We also can see better percent of, a uh, high percentage of mice tumor free following combination of carboplatin and 673. Carboplatin is very similar to cisplatin. And this is just PDX model. So this PDX was intrinsically resistant. We were taken from chemoresistant tumors, but they also propagated in mice for several generations with, this, with carboplatin to prove what they are still resistant after several generations in mice. They were treated with DMSO, carboplatin, or carboplatin and 673. As you can see, this tumor uh, indeed chemoresistant as carboplatin. The tumors treated with carboplatin didn't show any better prognosis than just control. As you pre can appreciate here, combination of therapy is very effective in PDX tumors as well. So we identify these LDH inhibitors. They are very effective uh, against chemoresistant cell lines, primary tumors, uh, primary spheroids, and there is no toxicity in mice. We checked there is no toxicity in mice. And because LDH is not specific to ovarian cancer, there are many LDH positive cells across different solid tumors, including breast, colon, and so on. It potentially can be used for different cancers. And what is take home message here? What Ovarian cancer cells, not only ovarian cancer cells, they are heterogene very heterogeneous. And when we treat them, we make them even more heterogeneous because we kill specific cells, but we enrich other cells, which following treatment start uh, uh, increasing several signaling pathways and so on. There is different effect on different subpopulation. Combinational treatment is one of our biggest hope because I don't see much sense to repeating cycles of the same drug based on our results. It can be really good for the first cycle of one drug to combine with a different drug, which together kill cells utilizing different cell signaling pathway. And genetic uh, phenotype uh, is potentially really important as well. And drug sequence is also really important. So it's so I was a postdoc in Ron Bukanovich lab at the University of Michigan, and I'm really grateful that he gave me this project, this necroptosis, because it's really exciting, it's new, and it became my career. These are people from my lab. I also was very lucky. I received um, many ovarian cancer foundational grants, and as an early career person, it's really Due to this, I was able to establish my lab. It's really, really important. So these are all different ovarian cancer foundation. And I just wanted to mention very briefly what I do right now in my lab. So from structural point of view, we are very interested to dissect necroptosome formation versus apoptosome formation. We are really very also additional Additional project of my in my lab is oxidative phosphorylation. So as we know, based on Warburg effect, 
cancer cell prefer glycolysis. This is true, but cancer cell can utilize oxidative phosphorylation, glutamine, fatty acid, is many other things. They are really good if you block glycolysis to switch and to adjust as fast as possible to different energy sources. And we're actually dissecting right now what happened to cell death pathway when cells are pushed to utilize only oxidative phosphorylation. And it's actually very exciting because the machinery works completely in a different way than cells in glycolysis condition. We also detected there is a synergistic effect between MEK inhibitors and LDH inhibitors in ovarian cancer. Apparently, there is no much sense to, for MEK inhibitors in high-grade serous ovarian cancer because there are no BRAS, keras mutation, yes? Uh, and MEK inhibitors were FDA-approved drugs for uh, BRAS, keras mutated cancers such as melanoma, colon cancer, and so on. But if you check primary sample, uh, ERK and MEK pathways are activated in high-grade serous despite lack of mutation. So we currently have a small paper, almost crazy, about MEK inhibitors in ovarian cancer. And what is really exciting, what LDH and MEK inhibitors work in synergy together, and it's not related anymore to necroptosis. There is a DNA repair which is affected when you combine two of them. Yeah, it's something new what we detected. There is also some synergy between glutamine inhibitors and LDH inhibitors in salines what more sensitive to glutamine. Glutamine can be one of the sources of energy for cancer cells. So as opposed to LDH and MEK synergy, which is true for all ovarian cancer cell lines, what we check, uh, glutamine inhibition uptake and LDH inhibition is true for only a few of them, and potentially is dependent on how much glutamine these cells utilize. We also detected the um, a role of LKB1 in necroptosis. LKB1 is one of the major kinases activating different metabolic pathway. If you know, um, AMPK alpha is the most famous downstream target of LKB, which is related to metabolism and so on. So we're trying to dissect LKB1 role and its downstream role targets in a necroptosis and so on. And again, I'm really grateful for all this Ovarian Cancer Foundation for all this uh, funding. It was detrimental to establish my own pub. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so in your slide where you had the tick assays, the tumor forming assays in mice, it was interesting to me that when you had the low number, zero out of eight formed. Yeah. But as you went up, you started to lose that effect. Yeah, and this is very logical because the smaller number of cells you use, the more difficult to establish tumors. So when you use smaller number of cells, this effect is completely abolished by combinational treatment. But then you use more cell numbers, uh, you have some, potentially some resistant cells, which were able to escape and they can uh, initiate. And That's what I was wondering is, does that mean, do you think that that means that there are even more heterogeneous stem cells that are kind of escaping the aldeflor rule? Yeah, I think this is true. So, you know, just to simplify things, we use double positive cells. But if you be able to see all this LDH assay, they are different population. They are the most bright one, and like we call DIM, and in between, yes. So you definitely have more than one population, and it really deserves some work if there is funding to dissect all this uh, positive population, because yes, there are more than just strict positive and strict negative. There are many cancer stem cell populations. Really nice talk. Um, I'm wondering if there's any data out there or if you know anything about whether the status of HRD for the tumor at all affects the effectiveness 
of these kinds of inhibitors? That would be my first question. And then the second is on that cute little cartoon you had of the necroptosis mm -hmm. pathway, mm -hmm. you had a little X and a question mark. So is there another kinase that affects the activity of RIPK1 and 3 in that necroptosis? Zone, or maybe that's something you're hoping yeah, to Yeah, this at. is what I'm looking for. What I've mentioned, you know, specifically stressed out what it was dissected using this kind of artificial model, and this is very specific cell in the colon cancer HT29. This is a classic model for necroptosis. So this is true for this specific model and so on. Okay. Yeah, okay. and it can be very potentially very different in other models. And what is really supporting what is different in other models, this is independent, an independent uh, situation of RIPKNS1. Okay. This is, we see complete independency of RIPKNS1 in our model, and there are several papers as well, in different models that support what RIPKNS1 can go to any possible direction and can potentially be important for necroptosis in very specific models. But is, do you, do you think there is another kinase regulating the RIP kinase 1 and or three, or 3, whichever, yeah. upstream? This is the, you, you know, know yeah. yeah. You know, okay. you, you usually you have at least several right. ones that right. okay. phosphorylate them. And there is always classic and alternative mm -hmm. and so right. on. Right. So there is no reason to believe, but in this case, this is not true. Right. Hence the question mark in the cartoon. Yeah. Okay. What was your first question? The, if you have any idea um, if the status of HRD, HRD is uh, hormone homologous recombination oh. deficiency, oh, yeah. like uh, some sort of genetic disposition like BRCA1 and BRCA2, yeah, yeah. is there any sense that these inhibitors would be more or less effective, kind, kind of like the PARP? Yeah, story. I understand your question. So from ovarian cancer cell line, you know, the one that you use usually in lab with BRCA mutation, this is PO1, yes, it was sensitive. What I have really last minute results from mice, mice what were treated with 673 and then we extracted tumors, dissociated them for, to single cells and then ran a QPCR for BRCA genes we see a decrease in BRCA genes. So potentially, this is very new finding, you mimic situation like real BRCA mutation and decrease BRCA effect, um, decrease BRCA expression following LDH inhibition, and then a new idea what potentially you could synthesize cells to PARP inhibitors, yes. But this is like very new finding and it's yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, uh, to combine, yes, so this is true, and I think in this case, we should not combine, we first have to treat this 673 to bring BRCA down, yes, and then, like sequentially, and then treat these PARP inhibitors, yeah, yeah, sure. So, to my knowledge, uh, UCP1, the uh, uncompleted pr protein 1, is only expressed in brown and beige uh, adipocyte. Yeah. Uh, many cells uh, made uh, UCP1 mRNA, but not protein. Even in brown adipose tissues, uh, changing the UCP1 iron level is not necessarily related to UCP1 protein expression. So, I'm wondering whether you have looked at UCP1 protein expression in your samples. Um, this is a very correct question because UCPs were discovered first in regard, as I mentioned, in regard to brown fat metabolism and so on. They are very important in obesity, diabetes, and so on. But there is importance of UCP in cancer, and yes, indeed, we ran Western blood. It's not easy to detect UCPs, but they can be detectable in ovarian cancer cell lines. Yeah, well. Another comment is that actually, at least in brown fat, the UCP1 protein not necessarily uh, translate to activity. It has to be activated by free fatty acids okay. to, to be able to have an uncoupling function. Yeah. 
And this is only, so UCP role in cancer is being debated. It can be related to its direct activity in uncoupling, also ROS production, recycling of AADPH and so on. There is a potentially different role of UCPs, not necessarily related to fatty acid. But indeed, if we go in depth to UCP function, this is something what's worth checking, what was the function of UCPs in this increase. Yeah. More questions? Do we have any questions on the phone? No? I don't think we do. No, Nick says no. not. Okay, no, no okay. questions on the phone. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, you for very coming much. today.